it's a <coughs> pleasure to be here with so many of you who uh, send uh, us patients and who also ask my advice on managing uh, various issues. And I have to say, aside from growth and thyroid and, and, and diabetes that you'll be hearing about in a little bit, uh, thyroid uh, issues are probably the third most common problem we see. And we only are seeing, as many of you know, a fraction of what we're asked to see. And the reason is that, uh, as you'll hear, many of the things that we're asked about are things that we're not too worried about. And so what I'd like to do today is to talk to you about ordering and interpreting thyroid tests. So my objectives are <coughs> to review the indications for thyroid testing. And you'll be surprised how many, how few they are. <laughs> Uh, situations where thyroid tests are likely to be helpful. And then we'll talk, uh, and we'll also talk about situations where thyroid tests aren't helpful. Uh, we'll discuss specifically which tests to order when you want to screen for thyroid. And <clears throat> we'll review cases which highlight difficulties in interpreting thyroid tests. Actually, we're not really going to talk much about management of hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism because you usually, once we get the patient, we take care of that, and you know, you, your job is to get us the, the patients. And we're really not going to talk a whole lot about thyroid physiology, so it's going to be short on physiology, but hopefully long on, on practical advice. So we're going to do physiology very briefly. And first question is, what is the physiologic role of thyroid hormones, uh, T4 and T3? And you know, it's not an easy question to answer. And you can talk about thyroid being important for growth and important for energy balance. But the real need for thyroid hormone is to keep us from having symptoms of hypothyroidism. So, you know, you explain to parents, well, if you don't have thyroid hormone, you feel this way. And if you have too much, you feel that way. And that gives them an idea of what it actually does. So I tried to here to give you a little bit of the, <coughs> the, the feedback issue. Um, you probably know that the thyroid is under control of the pituitary, but it's really under control of the hypothalamus as well. So thyroid hormone gland makes two thyroid hormones, uh, and it's basically what it's doing is the pituitary and to some extent the hypothalamus sense uh, how much, uh, they really sense not total T4, but that fraction which is free. So, uh, so basically the hypothalamus and the pituitary's job is to keep the uh, free T4 and T3 in, uh, in some narrow range. And so if the thyroid is sick and it's not doing its job, the TSH will go up so that you will then uh, produce more T4 and T3 and it basically shuts itself off. So in theory, any TSH which is increased means that you have hypothyroidism. However, in practice, uh, it's a lot more complicated as we'll talk about, particularly in borderline situations. So, so when do we think that thyroid tests should be ordered? I think the biggest one, and nobody would argue with this, is any time that you, you're examining a child or the mother brings it to your attention and there's a big gland and you can see it outlined, it's kind of shaped like a fat butterfly sitting in the midline. So any child with an enlarged thyroid, particularly if it's a one that you didn't know about before, if it's been enlarged for five years, that's different, but a newly enlarged thyroid you have to get uh, tests. Uh, and then you should be thinking about tests <coughs> when there are signs or symptoms suggestive of hypothyroidism. And they're not, uh, usually these signs and symptoms don't occur until the hypothyroidism is pretty, is moderate to severe. So new onset of fatigue, not the kid who's been tired since they were a baby, but the kid who used to be, have normal energy, but now is dragging to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, a child who feels cold all the time, you know, wearing sweaters when everybody else is comfortable in short sleeve shirts. Acquired growth failure. <coughs> um, in other words, a child that's been growing normally and then has a clear growth deceleration. And then less common, constipation and dry skin. But constipation and dry skin are never going to be the only signs. If they're present, there will be some other signs as well. And another good reason to order thyroid tests is if you get an abnormal newborn screening test, no matter whether it's mildly abnormal or very abnormal, you obviously want to, to follow it up. So those are the things, the, and, and then the other situation when you want to order thyroid tests is if you're thinking hyperthyroidism, 
And most kids, 90% of kids with hyperthyroidism have a goiter. And then they usually have one or more of these other signs that I've listed here. Hyperactivity, unintentional weight loss. They don't have to be thin. Some of these kids are quite overweight, but you know, six months ago they were 20, 25 pounds more overweight. So unintentional weight loss, unexplained tachycardia, you know, heart rate around 120, heat intolerance, and one of the biggies is declining school performance. About 80, 90 percent of kids are really struggling because they can't stay focused. So let's now talk about the situations where we get called, where thyroid testing A is low yield and B, we're more likely to get these borderline tests. And this may come as a shock to some of you, but obesity is not a good reason to order thyroid tests. The reason is that even, and studies have shown this, our, we we're, we're, uh, have data um, that we've developed on our own from our patients, that even severe hypothyroidism causes only a modest weight gain, and we're talking five or 10 pounds, and that weight gain is not fat, it's water. These patients come in looking puffy and edematous, you treat them with thyroid hormone, their face thin, their thins down, but that's not fat, that's water. So your typical 50 pound overweight patient that you have is not overweight because of hypothyroidism. Uh, another situation where you're not likely to encounter any <coughs> disease is kids with mild short stature who are growing at a normal rate. I would say they, their rate of hypothyroidism is not much different than the general population. Infants with failure to thrive, I mean, first of all, uh, congenital hypothyroidism 99% of the time is picked up on thyroid screening. And so acquired hypothyroidism, except for those very, very rare cases that are missed, is very, uh, it, it it's, it's usually doesn't start until about three years of age, autoimmune thyroiditis. So the infant with failure to thrive really is very unlikely uh, to have a thyroid issue. Um, you know, another one that we hear about all the time is if parents come in and demand that you screen their child because there's a relative that has thyroid disease. Well, you know, yes, the child, you know, if the mother and the grandmother have it, the child's risk is increased. It's still not very high. So every once in a while, you'll pick one up, but you're much more likely to get, you know, just uh, normal. Uh, menstrual abnormalities, I wouldn't say never, but it's really rare that menstrual abnormalities are, and if menstrual abnormalities are caused by hypothyroidism, it's gotta be so severe that other manifestations would be present. And similarly, you see a lot of kids who are overactive, but if you're just overactive, you don't have a goiter, tachycardia, or anything else, you're not likely to, uh, to find anything on thyroid. So when you finally decide that you are gonna order thyroid tests, which tests should you order? Well, the TSH uh, is the single most useful test. Uh, and the normal range, unfortunately, they keep shrinking the normal range. It used to be about 0.3 to 5.5, uh, then it became 0.5 to 5. Lately, it's like 0.6 to 4.4. So as the TSH range shrinks, we get more and more <laughs> kids who are outside of it. But that, that's obviously a test you need. And then we would suggest it be backed up by a free T4. And the reason why we suggest a free T4 rather than a total T4 is that free T4, which is the active, the 0.03% the of your thyroid hormone that's actually active and available to get into your cells, it's not affected by high or low levels of thyroid binding protein. The classic example is a teenager who has a T4 of 15 and a normal TSH. Well, that teen is probably on oral contraceptives, which increase TBG levels. So if you only got a free T4, you wouldn't even know about the high uh, total T4. And one of the problems with uh, free T4 is though is each lab has a somewhat different normal range. So you really have to pay attention to it. But in most labs, like Quest, it's about 0.9 to 1.6. The free T4s can be off. They're not perfect. There is a more accurate method that's called free T4 by equilibrium dialysis. And I will sometimes recommend you do it if you've gotten an abnormal uh, free T4 by the direct method. But it's more expensive, and it's not really what we use for screening. So just a fr standard free T4, also called the direct or non-dialysis method is what we'd recommend. That's a lot of people still do T4, and you can do a T4, but it's less reliable than the free T4 because it's affected by changes in binding protein. And you have to be aware that free T4 levels, on, that total T4 levels are age dependent. And some labs will give you the age-related normals, 
But so, in some labs, they'll only give you the adult normal range, which is 5 to 12. So if you get a, you know, a one-year-old with a T4 of 13, you'll say, aha, that's too high, but it's really actually perfectly appropriate for uh, a one-year-old. So, you know, th it used to be that free T4 assays were more expensive and less available, but now they're not much more expensive, they're widely available, so there really isn't any good reason to do a total T4 when you can order a free T4 and a TSH. So, which tests should you not use for screening purposes? And a lot of the um, requests that we get are because people do tests that aren't helpful. Unfortunately, the T3 level is, is a bad test. It's, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not infrequently mildly elevated when all of the other thyroid tests are completely fine. So it's, it's a little fussy. And, um, and so if you have a normal free T4 and a TSH, the T3 is, is meaningless. And so it's the best thing to do it is not to order it. We, okay, you know, the only time it's really helpful is if you, if you, if you have clear-cut hyperthyroidism, but then the free T4 is going to be high too. <coughs> do not order the free, T3, the free T3. Not only is it no more helpful than the T3, but it's a lot more expensive. So don't order. Now, thyroid antibodies are somewhat controversial. Um, because they do, you know, if they're at a very high level, they do indicate some increased risk in that way down the road you'll develop hypothyroidism. It doesn't mean you need thyroid hormone then. The problem with thyroid antibodies is that there's a high prevalence of them, 5%. In adults, it's like 10%, and it's higher in women. It, you know, as you get older, it's even higher. But about 5% of children have positive antibodies. So if you order antibodies, you're going to find a lot of euthyroid kids with positive antibodies, and then what do you do with them? You know, you, you, we don't need to see them because we don't base treatment on antibodies. The only time I think that antibodies are useful is if you have a mildly elevated TSH, and then the next time you repeat them down the road, which we'll talk about, uh, you might want to do antibodies simply because if you have a borderline TSH and high antibodies, the risk of them becoming hypothyroidism in the future is greater and you might want to monitor them more often. But we never treat patients based on antibodies alone because we don't, you know, many of these patients never become hypothyroid. So I'm going to now go to some cases, and I'll be uh, happy to accept participation from the audience. Okay. So the first case is a 10-year-old child who's seen in your office for a routine exam. And uh, you note that he has a diffusely enlarged thyroid, which hadn't been noticed on previous exams, but the child has no thyroid-related symptoms. And so you do the free T4, which is low normal, and the TSH, which is 30. So what is the most likely diagnosis? Anybody? What? Excuse me? Uh, girl. It, it shouldn't make a difference for this case. Either way, most likely diagnosis? Yeah, this is a classic presentation of Hashimoto's or autoimmune thyroiditis. And it's not hard to figure out why the patient is asymptomatic because the symptoms don't relate to the TSH being 30. The symptoms relate to how low the free T4 is. And although this free T4 is clearly low for this child, this child probably a year ago had a free T4 of 1.2. So, but, but usually you don't see symptoms unless the free T4 is well below normal. But with the TSH of 30, this is clearly a thyroid that is failing. And if you wait on it, it's just going to get worse. Uh, are there any additional tests you would want to do to confirm the diagnosis? Yeah, we usually like to get, uh, and the one that I prefer is thyroid peroxidase antibodies, which seems to be a little more specific than thyroglobulin antibodies. So what I would do, first of all, don't stick the kid. If you get a kid like this, just go ahead and send them, okay? What we will do is when we see the kid back for the follow-up visit, we will do the antibodies then, because the, the antibodies aren't going to go away. 90% of the time, cases like this will have positive uh, antibodies. Unfortunately, if they have negative antibodies, it doesn't rule out the diagnosis. There really aren't a whole lot of other things that give hypothyroidism in healthy 10-year-old kids. We just do not see um, uh, iodine deficiency much. Why is that? Yeah, salt is iodized. So, uh, the rate, uh, you know, there are certain parts of the world where iodine deficiency is um, 
we're seeing, but not in these states. So what do you think would be the main short-term benefit of treatment? The size of the gland should shrink. It doesn't go away, but that's what I tell the parents is, you know, if the gland is this big across, next time it'll be about that big. So, you know, in the long term, obviously, you're preventing this child from becoming hypothyroid, but in the short term, you would tell, uh, I would tell the parents that the gland is going to shrink. Uh, because it's the, the gland is growing because it's being stimulated by TSH, and but when you normalize the TSH, the gland will usually shrink. All right. <clears throat> so you order thyroid tests on a five-year-old boy who's growing up to fifth percentile, and so you want to make sure you're not missing anything. And his exam is normal. There's no goiter. The free T4 is 1.3, which is normal. The TSH is a bit low. So the question is, is this child have either established or early hyperthyroidism, and does he need to see an endocrinologist? Any, any volunteers? It's not, it's uh, 10th percentile. Okay, we get a lot of referrals like this, and um, the question is, I, wh what I'll tell you is that this child is not hyperthyroid, what would be the easiest, uh, the, the reason why he's not hyperthyroid, that I can tell you for sure that he's not hyperthyroid? It has not, it, it, it's, it's because the TSH is greater than 0.1. Everybody who's hyperthyroid, even if it's early, will have a TSH of less than 0.1. There is actually, with the exception of a child who's on thyroid hormone, if you have somebody who's on thyroid hormone, and you're trying to titrate the dose, this might tell you that they're on a little too much. But other than that, there is no clinical significance to having a normal free T4 and a slightly low TSH. It's a normal variation. So I would look at this and say, interesting, but nothing to do with, you know, with my child's problem, and I would just file it away. And you do not need to, the important thing is you don't need to do any additional tests. I've never seen one of these uh, go on to develop hyperthyroidism. And, you know, obviously if the child develops a goiter and classic symptoms, sure, repeat the test, but this does not need to be routinely repeated. Are there any questions before I go on? All right. <clears throat> so we have a 13-year-old girl now <clears throat> who's experiencing more fatigue than normal. But there's really nothing uh, on her history and her physical exam she, uh, I should mention that she's, uh, she's mid-pubertal, hasn't started her periods yet. So anyway, so you decide, need, need to get this uh, checked out. And so you get the free T4. Now, this is the direct free T4. Uh, and that comes back a little low, 0.84, just a little below the normal range. And the TSH is 1.6. My first question is, does this child have primary hypothyroidism? The reason is because, because the TSH isn't high. You can't have primary hypothyroidism without an elevated TSH. My second question is, um, are these results, do you, do you have a gut feeling that these results are, are the cause of her symptoms or are unrelated to the symptoms? How many people feel that, the, that, that, that you should pursue this uh, as being the cause of her symptoms? Show of hands. Not a, Nobody. <laughs> okay. So most people would accept the fact that, that this is a borderline abnormality and it's probably not why she's fatigued. Yeah, well, it's remarkable. I, I had a feeling that the, the ones who, are, who, who send me these cases the most are not in the audience, but we get a lot of, of referrals. <laughs> this always happens when I do CME programs. Is I present these cases and it's just, oh, why would you worry about that? Um, so people are convinced that these minor... Um, and, but, the, but here's the more important question. The more important question is, could this child have secondary or pituitary hypothyroidism? Because the hallmark of pituitary hypothyroidism is low free T4 and non-elevated TSH because the pituitary can't respond to the free, to, to, uh, free T4, to the low free T4 by increasing the TSH. How many people would work this child up for pituitary hypothyroidism? Nobody would do an MRI? Uh, <laughs> 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 
Well, here's the thing, is that you can't be 100% sure, but what you have to kind of keep in mind is that pituitary hypothyroidism, certainly as an isolated finding, does not come out of the blue. Pituitary, there is pituitary hypothyroidism, but it's usually seen in the setting of known CNS disease. So a child who's had radiation to the pituitary or surgery near the pituitary or something, you know, going on in that area <coughs> could very well have, you know, pituitary hypothyroidism and might even need to be uh, put on treatment. So we always follow free T4s in patients who've had pituitary tumors or surgery or radiation. Um, but here's a kid who's basically growing normally. She's going through puberty normally. A f fatigue is not something that would suggest that we're missing a, brain, uh, a, a pituitary tumor. So I would say that, that the far likely, likely possibility is that this is a, a normal variation. What you have to remember about these normal ranges is that a normal range means that 95% of people fall between 0.9 and 1.6. That means that there's 2.5% that are low and 2.5% that are high. And so what I would say is this patient is probably just a normal variation. And, and I've seen, you know, doctors repeat these tests like three times, and it's usually, you know, it's, it's usually not lab error. You know, you repeat it next time, it'll be 0.86 or 0.80. But if it really bugs you, you know, like you, you can't rest on it, what I would suggest is that you, uh, you repeat it by the dialysis method. Because the dialysis method is the gold standard, it's more accurate. And I would say that we used to see these patients, and when we the only assay we do at Children's is that equilibrium dialysis assay. And every time we saw one of these kids with a low free T4, we would do it in Children's and it would be normal, so I finally decided we don't need to see these. You know, we're not doing these patients any good. So you can either write it off as a normal variant or do the equilibrium dialysis, and then I would quit. You know, if the equilibrium dialysis test is low or if it's getting lower, then we'll, we'll figure out a way to see the child. Any questions? Okay, the next one is the biggie. Uh, <laughs> this is one that uh, is, uh, is, takes a lot of our time. So here's the scenario. <coughs> you you, uh, you, you, you ha, um, decide that as part of your obesity workup, you need to rule out hypothyroidism. So we've got a, the, the linear growth is fine. The, as are most obese patients, the child is on the tall side. Increasing along the 90th percentile, <coughs> we'll just say that the BMI is 28. And uh, so you do a free T4, which is normal, and the TSH is 6.5. So there's no goiter, and the exam is normal, except for the obesity. How many people would say, based on these tests, that this child has hypothyroidism? Every, everybody wants me to see these patients, so, so somebody must be worried about this. <laughs> okay, well, how many, well, the next one is kind of a, a it's a sort of a semantic issue. Um, would we, should we call this subclinical hypothyroidism? And so the idea of subclinical hypothyroidism is that they're hypothyroid, but they don't have symptoms yet. And, you know, they don't have symptoms yet because the free T4 is normal. But the implication is that over time, there's a good chance that this will become overt hypothyroidism. So, you know, many people just as a uh, define subclinical hypothyroidism as anybody with a normal free T4 and a TSH, you know, that's mildly elevated. So you could, we could call this subclinical, but, but here's the, the critical question is, should you refer this child right away or should you follow up for treat, you know, for us to see the patient and consider starting this kid on treatment or should you follow this in your office? How many of you would feel more comfortable getting, um, getting us to see this patient uh, right away. And be honest. There must be somebody. Where, 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 are all the, where are all our referrals coming from? <laughs> okay. Well, the truth of the matter is this is controversial. You know, I, I don't want to give you the impression that all people in endocrinology agree on what to do with these patients. But here's the argument for. The argument for treating subclinical hypothyroidism is the pituitary knows best. And you know, there are, uh, th th that any patient with even a slightly elevated TSH is by definition in a mildly hypothyroid state 
no matter what the level of free T4 is. And one of the reasons I say that is, well, you know, free T4 is 1.1, but maybe a year ago <coughs> it was 1.4, and so the patient's on the way down. So, so many people would say that just because the TSH is high means that the patient's hypothyroid. And then the other thing is that the, the adults have done a huge number of studies. They followed these patients for years, and that a small percentage, it's somewhere in the 2 to 5 percent a year, of such patients will progress to overt hypothyroidism over time. And one of the predictors seems to be antibodies. If you have antibodies, you're about two or three times more likely to become hypothyroid than if you don't have antibodies. So those are the arguments. You know, so a lot of people would say, well, they may not be hypothyroid now, but they're, you know, eventually they're going to get there, so let's get them on treatment. So, but then there's the arguments for against treating. And um, the reason I, we don't, uh, uh, many of us don't treat these patients is, first of all, there's no symptoms that are attached to having, you know, a TSH of 6.5 in and of itself causes no symptoms. And <clears throat> here's where the, the critical uh, piece here is that um, experience, and I will show you some of this experience in a minute, suggests that most patients with mildly elevated TSH show no evidence of progression over many years of follow-up. Although the TSH will sometimes return to normal, but it often remains in that borderline level. And we've actually found, it's been found, this is fairly recent, that some patients like this with a, you know, lifelong borderline elevated TSH actually have mutations in the TSH receptor such that the receptor is functioning, but it takes two or three times more TSH than normal to activate the receptor. So for, you know, so th this is something that's almost like a fixed defect, uh, but the patient is euthyroid as long as they make a little extra TSH. And the other reason for not treating is that very, you know, if you have a borderline TSH and a goiter, that suggests that the thyroid might be sick. It doesn't prove it, but it's it, more possible. But few of these patients, and, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong because you've all seen these patients, few of these patients with the borderline TSH actually have a goiter. And we do, some of them do, and we do see those. Anyway, so, so if you put these patients on thyroid hormone, you will normalize the TSH, but it's really uncommon that the parents or the patients report any benefit. Uh, I've treated, you know, I occasionally treat one of these patients, uh, and they're, if they're tired, they're usually still tired. Occasionally they'll say, oh my God, I put them on, you know, you put, you know another doctor put my child on thyroid hormone, and it's just amazing. Well, how much of that is placebo effect? You know, if I was the other doctor and I said, your fatigue is from your TSH of six and you're going to feel better, some patients will feel better just because you tell them they're going to feel better. So um, my feeling about this is that treating patients like this may normalize the TSH, but you're, what you're really doing is treating the number and not the patient. So now I'm going to show you some actual data. And this was published a year ago. And it was, it's uh, data from Israel. They actually have a database from one of their large insurance companies. They had like, a, you know, 10,000 patients that had TSH levels done. And, or, uh, and then the, what they did was they, they categorized them according to what happened um, in the future. Uh, and they, they basically had follow-up TSH levels so, uh, up to five years later. So you had an initial TSH and then follow-up. So if you start on the, the right, if the initial TSH was normal, the follow-up TSH was normal um, almost 100% of the time. A very, very small number um, uh, had, uh, had um, borderline high TSH. This is the interesting group. If you had a TSH of between 5 and 10, and these were patients that by and large were not being treated unless they also had low free T4, of the patients between 5 and 10, uh, about a third, uh, about 30 percent of them had a persistently um, elevated TSH. Look at this, over 70 percent of them had the TSH normalized. And then there was a very few down here, oh, maybe 2 or 3 percent, actually the TSH went over 10. Uh, I'm going to ignore this because we've already dispatched, uh, dispensed with the TSH less than 0.35, but many of those normalize as well. But here's the interesting thing. Even when the TSH is over 10, um, a lot of those patients normalize, 40%, um, 35% persist, and there's about 25% that maintain high TSH, and many of those 
but that, that's a relatively small number that actually go on to require thyroid hormones. So basically, and there are other natural history studies that suggest that the majority of these patients do not become hypothyroid over a several year follow-up. Um, and then we actually did a study of children's that I wanted to share with you. Um, what we basically did was I had noticed that there were a lot of patients that I was seeing at children's <coughs> who were started on thyroid hormone by a physician who's no longer, mostly by a physician who's no longer with us. But she, sh this physician <laughs> would treat a lot of these patients with normal free T4 and mildly elevated TSH. And the TSHs were mostly less than 20, but there were some newborns that had TSHs in the 20 to 40 range, which is kind of borderline for a newborn. Anyway, over time, many of these patients um, were either on the same dose of thyroid hormone as before or had actually had a decrease of thyroid hormone. So I took this subset of patients, what we analyzed, that there was a subset of patients that were on a fairly small dose and had a normal TSH, and the dose was usually 20 five to 50 micrograms a day. And I told the parents that I wanted their children to come off thyroid hormone for a month and be retested. It turns out that the majority of these patients, about 60%, had been started on thyroid hormone in the first year of life. And what we found was that um, the highest initial TSH, so some of these patients had moderately high TSHs. Um, the highest initial TSH was six to nine, in a quarter of them, 10 to 20, 20 to 40, greater than 40 in some of them, and a fair number of them had Down syndrome. And the mean thyroid hormone dose when they started treatment was about 32 micrograms, and, when they, and after a mean of three and a half years, they were on about the same dose. So we took them off for a month, and here's what we found, is that um, the, the TSH, while they were on treatment, the mean TSH was uh, 2.4, and it did go up off treatment to about 5. Um, off treat, you know, on treatment, almost all of them had TSHs of less than 5, but off treatment, 53% uh, had a normal TSH. Uh, we had one on treatment that had a TSH of 5. Uh, off treatment, about a third of them had a TSH of 5 to 10. Four of the 34 patients had a TSH of 10 to 15, and not a single one had a TSH of over 15. So basically what I can, we conclude is that many patients who are started on thyroid hormone with these mild to moderate TSH elevations do not have true hypothyroidism. They often are started in the first year of life, and one of those reasons is that people are very nervous about borderline high TSHs in the first year of life because of the concern that the patients are going to become mentally retarded if you don't treat them aggressively. Um, and a lot of these patients were treated because the physician assumed that sooner or later they were going to develop hypothyroidism. So, you know, my philosophy is uh, that it's reasonable for patients who are started on T4 and have mi with mild elevation of TSH and who maintain normal TSH on a low dose to be given a month trial off thyroid hormone. And parents are u not always, but usually okay with that. You know, why keep giving medications if you don't need to? So what do you do when you have, when a child comes to your office and has a normal T4 of TSH and a T, normal T4 and a TSH of five to nine? Well, I think as you've figured out by now, we're in no rush to see these patients. Uh, we will see these patients if they have a goiter. Um, most of them still will have normal TSHs, but I believe that they have a greater chance of having thyroid disease. For the other patients, my suggestion is that you repeat don't repeat it in three weeks or a month or two months because what you really want to do is you want to give it time to evolve. So, you know, uh, so if you repeat it in a, in, in, you know, a lot of people say, oh my gosh, I got to repeat this, and they repeat it a week later, it's exactly the same. So give it six to 12 months. And if the TSH rises to greater than 10, we'll see them. But most of the time, the TSH either decreases to normal or remains in the five to 10 range. And so then the question is, should one use antibodies to decide if this child should be treated? We don't use antibodies, but we might, huh, five, okay, there you go. Um, but we might use antibodies to, uh, to decide how often. If the antibodies are negative, we might say, hey, this child's not gonna develop thyroid, you know, thyroid, uh, overt hypothyroidism, let's leave them alone. If the antibodies are positive, there's a family history, probably yearly follow-up is good. Okay, we're gonna do a few more cases and then wrap up. So here's a girl who has complained of irregular periods 
and has a free T4 of 1.72 and a TSH of 1.1. What would you tell the parents? Well, that's, that's a good point. Um, would you repeat it or would you uh, shrug it off? This is kind of the flip side of the kid with the, with the borderline low free T4. A borderline high free T4 with the normal TSH is not hyperthyroidism. So, uh, so basically, I would view this as the you know kid on the top uh, on the you know on the other side of the bell-shaped curve. If the TSH is normal, there's no goiter. I would write it off as a normal variant, and I would tell the parents, as you said, that this is not a thyroid issue. Okay. Well, how about a patient that you really need to worry about? <laughs> A uh, newborn screening lab calls to report that an eight-day-old infant tested at two days of age had a T4 of eight, but a TSH of 212. What would you do next? Um, how many people would send another blood spot to the state lab for confirmation? Okay. What? Okay. Well, no, actually, state lab will not ask. State lab for, for, for TSH of 212. They will ask you to send another spot if you have a low T4 and a normal TSH. But for a TSH of 212, um, you really need to get a commercial, you know, you need to get a confirmatory test. You don't want to wait another week while the state lab cranks out another one. So the answers to this question are, um, by the way, uh, you, this is not one of those cases where you tell the parents to call for a pediatric endocrine appointment because, you know, we're not perfect, and sometimes these patients call and they don't make it clear to the scheduler that this is an emergency and we need to get this child seen right away. So uh, the answers would be three and four. Call your pediatric endocrinologist, and then it's up to us. If we can get the kids seen within a few day, a day, then we'll take care of the whole thing. If for some reason we can't, then we'll tell you what dose of thyroid hormone to start the kid on, and we'll see the kid back in a month. But the key thing is that you need to get a, a commercial uh, free T4 or T4 and a TSH to confirm it. All right, um, a 15-year-old girl complains of rapid heart rate, difficulty sitting still, failing grades in school. She's lost 20 pounds in the last year and is not, uh, and is not dieting. She has a rapid heart rate. The thyroid is diffusely enlarged. All these things um, are you know, pretty uh, uh, definitive. Do you need any additional tests at this time? Anybody want to do any tests before taking action? You know, antibody tests aren't going to make a difference here. <laughs> You've got pretty darn clear-cut hyperthyroidism. Uh, and so the important thing is to get, to get this kid uh, on treatment. And, and this is one of those things where, uh, you know, once again, you do not want to tell them to call and make an appointment. Uh, uh, one of three things works. You can email me, you can fax me a note, and I usually see it within 24 hours, but sometimes I, um, uh, you know, it might be a couple of days, but it will get seen pretty quickly. Or you can call me or the endocrinologist on call, and we, uh, we get these patients seen within a week, uh, sometimes sooner. I've seen many of these patients next day. So, you know, these are symptomatic patients, and, uh, you know, the child will obviously survive, a, a, you know, a month, but once we know about it, we want, you want to get your patients seen quickly. Yes? Yes. Uh, no, cancer does not uh, give you uh, these kind of symptoms in a diffusely enlarged thyroid. On rare occasions, you can have hyperthyroidism due to a hot nodule. Um, and, you know, when we examine the child, we would be able to feel the nodule. But I would say that ultrasounds and thyroid scans are not helpful in classic cases of hyperthyroidism. They just slow things up. Yeah, you will do an ultrasound, and guess what? You will see a diffusely enlarged thyroid, just like you could feel on your exam. So we would not recommend uh, any additional tests. Antibody tests can be done at a later time if we decide they're needed. The important thing is get this patient to us quickly. Okay, um, speaking of ultrasound, um, you see a child with a diffusely enlarged thyroid, no palpable nodules, normal free T4 and TSH. Uh, how many 
people in this particular situation would do an ultrasound? Can I have a show of hands? How many would want to do an ultrasound? Okay. What we find in this, first of all, this is what we call the euthyroid goiter. We, we don't treat these patients, but um, what, we fi what we find is that, um, that ultrasounds aren't helpful here. And the reason why is that you, when you do the ultrasound in a case with no palpable nodules, you're not likely to find anything big, but what you're likely to find is these tiny little micro-nodules. How many of you have had the experience of seeing these micro-nodules? Well, you see these micro-nodules, and you get worried, oh my God, there's a five millimeter nodule. We've got to do something. First of all, cancer of the thyroid is not real common because the, the nodules are almost always over a centimeter, and you cannot biopsy anything under a centimeter. So my advice is let a, uh, don't, do, uh, don't do any ultrasounds if you can't feel anything. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, go to the summary. Okay, so my advice to you, first of all, is to try to avoid ordering thyroid tests in situations where the diagnostic yield is very low because you're much likely to get one of these borderline test results that we've talked about than one that requires immediate attention. The fewer tests you order, the less time you'll have to spend figuring out what to do with these tests that are slightly outside the normal range, but of dubious clinical significance. For the people who really need treatment, the tests are not borderline. They're very clear cut, as I've shown you. Um, I want a, uh, <clears throat> an honest answer. Could uh, I show of hands? How many of you have received a fax that looks like this? Okay. Yeah, this is my sort of shorthand uh, way of uh, letting you know that yes, I've received your labs. Uh, there's two choices on here. One is for the normal free T4 and the low TSH. That's on the top. The other one. So it's basically my shorthand. My so I don't have to write it out each time why we're not worried about the borderline low and the borderline high TSH. And I, some people are probably put off by this, but you know, here's, the, here's the, the problem, is why do we even bother to screen? Why don't we see all these kids? Well, I, I know many, many of you are not uh, uh, guilty of this, but we get a large number of, of requests for consults based on these abnormal tests, most of which are thyroid. And I can usually tell just by looking at the test results that these kids are not uh, likely to need treatment. So when parents tell our schedule is that the request is based on an abnormal lab, that's when you get called and asked to fax us the lab. By the way, it is helpful if when you fax the lab, you put in why you did the lab to begin with, because a lot of times we sit there looking at the labs, trying to base, you know, well, uh, looks like they ordered lipids and an insulin level and a glucose, must be an obese kid. You know. So we try to figure it out. But anyway, how many such requests do we get? Well, we tracked this for three months. <coughs> And we had 64 requests in three months related to a normal T4 and a TSH between 5 and 9. It's tw over 20 a month. And actually, it's worse because they lowered the TSH um, to range to 4.4. So now we're getting the 4.5s and the 4.6. So of those 64, five of them had goiters and were given appointments. The other 59 did not have. And we also had 16 requests for other thyroid abnormalities, such as we've discussed here. So should we try to see these patients? Well, right now, as many of you know, the wait time, it's better than it used to be, but it's still one to three months depending on locations. And a lot of you feel that this is too long to wait. Well, if we scheduled everybody who requested an appointment, the wait time for patients that we might actually be able to help, the kids with short stature, precocious puberty, miscellaneous endocrine problems would be greater, and you would not be happy any happier. So, so, um, so my, my uh, advice is to be, uh, understand why we have this process. I know it's a little frustrating at times, but when, when thyroid problems are urgent, I think you'll agree that we take it very seriously. So when do we want to, when is it work we consider urgent? If the free T4 is low and the TSH is greater than 20, those patients will start to feel better a week or two after starting, and then the moderate to severe hyperthyroidism, usually within four to six weeks, they'll feel better.